Well, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are, everyone, and welcome to this very special event. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Mark Del Monte. I am the CEO of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and I'm also the chair of the board of directors of the Primary Care Collaborative. This is an important launch event for us today, and uh, we're thrilled to have you here. Let's get right into it uh, to tell you what the Primary Care Collaborative is doing and why it is so important. There is nothing more important than health. Our health, the health of our children and families, and the health of our communities. We have been painfully reminded of the value of good health over the last two years and the unfortunate gaps that exist. But the reality is that our nation's health was lagging before the COVID pandemic. We were four years behind in life expectancy as compared to the European Union and COVID will only likely make things worse. Our path to changing this trajectory runs right through primary care. So we are coming together today to speak with one voice about how to reimagine and rebuild primary care so that we can better serve all communities. The evidence base is crystal clear. Primary care is the only part of the healthcare system where when we invest more, we achieve better population health outcomes and more equitable care. That is why the Primary Care Collaborative is launching Better Health Now, bringing our diverse community together to fight for bold policy change. And the PCC is the organization to help convene our community and lead this change. PCC is a nonpartisan nonprofit we are a national multi-stakeholder organization focused on strengthening primary care. The PCC has a successful track record in bringing together diverse stakeholders around policies that benefits patients. The time is now. Incrementalism in the face of what we have experienced in the last few years is simply a non-starter. The stakes are too high and we as leaders are coming together to step up to this challenge with our Better Health Now campaign. And so today you'll hear from some of those primary care leaders and from people in communities who have lost too much and have too much at stake to settle for a healthcare system that is not meeting their needs or consistently delivering good outcomes. Gather up your questions, we'll have time at the end to hear your comments and to gather and answer your questions. But first, let's get started right now. Let me turn it over to Ann Greiner, who is the president and CEO of the Primary Care Collaborative. Thank you so, Mark, so much, Mark, and thank you uh, for leading the PCC board. I also want to thank the PCC board, our staff, our executive members, our advisors, and our funders, the Commonwealth Fund and the Samueli Foundation. All of you have contributed, contributed so much uh, to getting us here today, and we so appreciate all that you do. As Mark said, there's nothing more important than our health. That's why so many of us rely on primary care to partner with us and our families on our path uh, to primary care. Uh, uh, partner with us and our families on our path to healthier, more fulfilling lives. I am wondering why I am not seeing my camera. Uh, I just wanna make sure that that is working properly. I'm so sorry. Um, there we go, thank you. Unfortunately, too many of us cannot find a primary care clinician who's taking new patients. And when we do, it often feels like the visits are too short, the appointments too scarce, and perhaps the deductible uh, too steep to even make an appointment. And some communities are harder hit than others. The shortage of primary care across rural and underserved communities, urban and small town communities is linked to shorter lifespans and the aggregate loss of 85 lives per day as compared to communities where primary care is more robust is an unbelievable statistic for us to dwell upon and consider. And the costly life of health and, uh, of health and life was calculated even before COVID-19. 
The pandemic hit our communities hard. To recover and thrive, families and individuals in every community need access to primary care that works for them, that treats them as a whole person, integrating medical, mental, and social needs. And yet, the US invests only five cents on the dollar in primary care. And the price that we pay as a country for that underinvestment is high, way too high. Look around us. We have a mental health crisis for adults and children at epic proportions. We have uncontrolled hypertension and diabetes, robbing us of healthy days and reducing our life expectancy. We see a serious uptick in addiction. And we also know about unaddressed oral health needs. All of this while our costs continue to climb. We can and must do better. And we have a launching pad to reorient our system toward health. The National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine, commonly known as NASM's Primary Care Consensus Report. This report is a call to action to rebuild our faltering foundation of our health system, primary care. Better Health Now is the banner we have all come together around, and we have defined three major principles, which I will now lay out. These principles track to five more detailed concordance recommendations that guide our way. Please see uh, in the chat for these documents, which are also available on our website. So the three principles, and they all make so much sense. Number one, invest in what works. And the evidence shows that that is primary care. Policymakers and healthcare leaders should reorient our healthcare systems towards primary care so that we have more sustainable, community-focused and equitable health. Quality in life will improve in communities with greater investment in primary care. Principle number two, pay for what we want. We all want better health. Today we pay piecemeal, shelling out for every test, procedure, and visit, regardless of whether we get well and regardless of how it affects our bank balance. Instead, we should pay for whole person preventive care that keeps us healthy and keeps us from getting sick via convenient in-person or video visits, phone calls, texts, or portal messages. This care exists for some, and it works best when it's paid prospectively, like a prescription service. We urge all healthcare payers to transition to primary care models that support primary care teams' focus on better health. This prospective amount should be adjusted to support diverse expert teams delivering an array of services that are comprehensive and offering convenient access and choice for all kinds of communities. Number three, we must reduce economic and social barriers to better health. From small towns to our biggest cities, to our own neighborhoods, many communities face growing barriers to better health, whether that's from recent hard economic times to decades of underinvestment and exclusion. Community-based primary care teams that know reflect and are responsive to those communities and focused on improving whole person health, mind and body, are teams that build trust. These kind of robust primary care teams can partner and innovate with other community organizations and services to overcome economic and social barriers that get in the way of better health. The five concordance recommendations will guide our future campaign's policy agenda. We will focus advocacy on bold steps that the executive branch and congressional leaders must take to reorient the Medicare and Medicaid programs to strengthen primary care in all communities and pivot to better health. And we will seek to align our efforts with leaders in the private sector. We started on our path by uniting more than 40 stakeholders around a vision and sense of purpose that puts better health now for all communities front and center. And we also expect to welcome other organizations to the campaign. 
we have absolutely no intention to go back to the health system we had before COVID. We know that we can do better and get further faster by working together. Thanks so much, Anne. Thank you for your expertise and for your leadership and for your comments setting the stage. Next up, we'll hear from Dr. Rebecca Etz, who is the co-director of the Larry A. Green Center, a research group at Virginia Commonwealth University and an anthropologist. For the past two years, the PCC has worked with Becca and her team on regular national surveys of primary care clinicians and patients. These surveys have provided the only comprehensive picture of primary care's response and capacity during the COVID-19 pandemic and provided insight into the impact of the pandemic on primary care clinicians and their patients. Becca's remarks will give us the lay of the land as of March, 2022, so we can understand more fully the issues that this campaign will directly address. Becca. Thanks, Mark. Summarize two years in under 10 minutes, no pressure. <laughs> okay. Next slide, let's just move on into it. Um, I typically am a, a high energetic speaker. Um, I am going to try to tone myself down a little bit because I wanna make sure that everybody hears me very clearly. We are talking about primary care, which is the place where people get care where they live, work and play. This is care that is in your communities and it is meant for you. They are people, if we take, we've got lots of uh, academic definitions, but I'm not talking about the academic definitions or the policy definitions. I'm talking about what it means for people, otherwise known as patients at times. Primary care is a place that is worthy of our trust, that deals with us in the wholeness of our dignity. That's what we mean when we say person focused care. It's a place where it's safe for us to be vulnerable and where they put our interests first, patient interests first above their own. Next slide. That's the platform that I'm talking about. Um, as, as we've mentioned, I've done a survey for a past couple of years. We've done a lot of them. You'll have a copy of this slide. You can read everything about them that you want. I really wanna underscore that I thank every single person who has participated in this survey effort, as well as our funders who have stood by us all this time. Next slide. Uh, what we know and what I'm sharing now is really largely from the patient surveys. Uh, we surveyed patients bi-monthly during the course of the pandemic. And what we know is that inequities grew. Our social drivers got worse, but we may not understand how much worse. And we may not understand that the inequities did not grow evenly for everybody. So what we compare here is social drivers as they've gone up during the pandemic for uh, housing insecurity, food insecurity, uh, mental health, and you'll note that we have two numbers here. One is for nationally what patients report, and one is for what patients who would go to federally qualified health centers report. These are patients that tend to be among our more vulnerable in our population, and I want you to see that the gap is fairly large. Next slide, please. Another thing that I'd like you to understand is how primary care is happening. All of these are way too quick, but we've only got limited time, so I'm happy to answer any questions. But on the whole, what I want you to see here is a comparison of the light blue May of 2020 through to this month, March of 2022 in orange and how visits are happening. Virtual visits were a lifeline in the beginning of the pandemic. You can see that all three, video, phone, and, and in-person were happening at about the same rates. Even now, virtual has not gone down so much, but in-person has gone up a lot. What you should understand from this is both the value of virtual care, its ability to improve access for patients, patient interest in using it, but also that we have more visits happening this year than we have in the past. Next. Thank you, and we have different kinds of visits happening. Um, we had a reduction in wellness visits this when we were uh, during the height of the pandemic, 
But keep in mind that does not necessarily mean a reduction in chronic illness or in other acute conditions. Primary care sees quite a few of these. So what we have reported here are the reductions that we saw, fewer practices able to do chronic um, maintenance visits, fewer practices doing wellness checks, those going up in March of 2022, but still not quite complete. Next slide, please. And then we have ways in which patients are limiting their own self-care. I don't like to ask if your finances are causing you, uh, if you think about your finances when thinking about your care, because just about everybody does. Uh, so I typically start out by asking if you limit your care for these reasons. And what we see is 42% of the population overall is limiting their care, whether it's for a high copay, because they have a high deductible count, or because they have no insurance. There, are, there is a minority that actually doesn't consider cost when planning their car, but their own care, but it is small. Next. We asked patients how they knew primary care was there for them during the pandemic. It's easy to demonstrate and, and patients were very clear about this. I often highlight this for my clinician friends because it can feel when you're in the thick of it, like people aren't appreciating what's happening, but they really do. They know exactly what you did. They said primary care was there when we needed it, um, which is what we say of primary care. They say, help me to make sense of things. A fractured experience is made integrated in a primary care practice. It was a place for trusted information. Equal parts of people said it was a place for trusted information and it was the place that stayed open during the pandemic when I couldn't get care elsewhere. Almost 20% report that they would have used urgent care were it not for their primary care practice. Next. When we asked, and this is a real thing, uh, people didn't think Lehman Brothers could close. They didn't think Bear Stearns could close, and they did. Primary care could close. So when we talk to patients about, is that important to you? Is that something that would cause you some distress? 79% re reported something along the lines of, I would be panic-stricken, heartbroken, or upset if my primary care practice closed. I, I'm not bothering to share with you the middle people, right? These are the people who, who talked about layers of panic and upset. Less than 20% said it wouldn't affect them at all. So you know you're talking about at least 80% of the population. Next slide, please. Where do people want to get care? This is always the most interesting to me because in 30 years, we don't have any empirical studies about where people want to get care and why. We have focus groups, we have other things, but, but we don't have a, a scientific study that tells us. Um, so I asked the question, we have 12,000 responses and what they said five times over, they wanted a traditional practice. The, the next down the line was an urgent or walk-in. And this doesn't mean they want it over a traditional practice. It means that sometimes convenience is more important than a longitudinal relationship if you wanna get something like a flu shot. From the patient perspective, we perhaps have a need to meet those interests. Um, online, virtual, emergency department, these are all further down the list. Now the next slide, what I wanna show you is that there is a difference between what people get and what they prefer. And we often look at claims data and assume that what people have purchased is what they prefer. It's not. It is what they were able to do within a constrained system. So here, what I'm wanting to show you is that when we ask where they went after we ask what they preferred, you can see that traditional clinic is still at the top, but there's some movement around, in particular, emergency department visits. So the less access we have to primary care, the more we use emergency departments. This holds true with what they said about uh, roughly 18% going to urgent care. Next slide, please. What does this mean for primary care? Well, the workforce is straining. Um, if you don't know that, I, I hope this isn't um, unsettling to you, or maybe I hope it is. Um, but what you need to know is that a healthy healthcare system has 40% minimum in primary care. The US entered the pandemic with 33. Its medical schools were producing new primary care doctors at a rate of about 10 to 12%. So we were starting off in a poor position. 
During the pandemic, we have seen an increase in, in clinicians from a national sample telling us that they are aware of others who quit and retire early. I put this stat up there because everybody asked me how many practices quit and we don't have any national data set. So there's no way for us to really know. But I can tell you that 67% report they have personal knowledge of clinicians who have retired or quit. And these are not people who live within walking distance of each other. Next slide. We then have open positions that can't be filled. This is another indication. Staffing is really hard to come by. 68% are now reporting as of, it's actually consistent now with March of this year, 68% are reporting that they have staff positions they can't fill. This leads to 22% and only 22% of practices saying they are fully staffed. Next. The clinicians are also saying of their patients, we have known a tremendous increase in mental health burden. We've watched conditions worsen. We've, we've had visits that have more complaints and greater complexity, more things and more complicated things. Next slide. Take that and keep that in mind, started at 33%, going down during the pandemic, and then I want you to understand that this workforce has extended themselves extensively. I've only got about a minute here, so I'm gonna buzz through these for you, but internally, they have become more involved in mental health. They've extended services beyond what they normally do, particularly around um, ear and, I'm sorry, particularly around sight and dental care. Um, and they have done more to help their patients with social drivers. In addition, they have been volunteering externally They've been volunteering at mass vaccination sites. They've been doing a great amount of public speaking and have increased or added hospital time they didn't have in an effort to save our tertiary care system from the overflow. Next slide. I wanna leave you then with what I think are truly unshakable truths. Health has worsened. Primary care has weakened. And there is a new public health emergency brewing. If you have any doubt of that, you need only consult the 56% of physicians who have not been able to deliver childhood immunizations as they have in previous years. Primary care was there for us. It is still there for us. I don't know. I think let's be there for them. Thanks. Well, thank you, Becca. Um, I don't know if there's anybody who can hear that data and not want to do something. Uh, we, we need to be there for primary care. And so thank you for what you have been doing. And the, the survey data is so incredibly valuable. So let's talk about what we can do. We'll hear next from Dr. Asaf Bhattan, who is executive director of Ariadne Labs, a center for health systems innovation at Harvard Medical School. Like Becca, Asaf conducts research to understand the trends in primary care. And he was a member of the National Academies of Science and Science Engineering and Medicines Committee that produced the landmark report released last year on implementing high quality primary care. He helped write the chapter on payment reform in that report. So we have the right expert uh, that we need right at the right time. His presentation will help us understand the importance of payment reform and further investments in primary care. Asaf, over to you. Thanks so much, Mark, and it's really a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, you know, I would uh, I would just like to also add, you know, I'm a practicing primary care doctor, and um, everything that Rebecca and Mark and Anne have spoken about resonates with me uh, and the communities that we serve. So the real sort of question, um, because we in primary care are um, are, are a practical bunch, and and we don't just sort of um, uh, are, we are not content to just problematize or name issues and hope that someone else will fix it. But we want to be part of that solution, and I think that that was why the um, the National Academies report was in some ways so imp uh, came at such an opportune time. And and Rebecca Etz also served on that. Um, committee. And what I want to share with you is not a recitation of what those 426 pages said, but really a summary and a highlight and, and a concordance with the PCC concordance recommendations. Because the top line message here is that the evidence and lived experience and health plan and provider communities, I believe, are converging on a series of steps that can make 
tractable and possible what the PCC concordance recommendations uh, are putting forth. This isn't pie in the sky. This isn't, uh, well, let's just wait 10 more years. I think you've heard a very clear articulation of the need being now because primary care as the provision of whole person integrated, accessible, equitable healthcare by teams that are accountable for addressing the majority of an individual's health and wellness needs across settings and across their lifespan through relationships. Really the relationships are the mechanism of action here is um, uh, a, a core part of what we can do moving forward to keep our health system working and it hasn't been working and it isn't working and it isn't working for all. Um, but the question really is um, there uh, is how we can translate what we already know into what we are doing differently. What the report found very clearly, very clearly is that primary care is the only part of the healthcare system in which investments in it routinely, regularly, and predictably result in both improved outcomes and improved equity. There is no other part of the healthcare system that you as a policymaker, as a payer, as a provider, or a recipient or partner in that as a patient or family can, can take an investment and reliably, routinely, and predictably turn it into better health with more equity. That clearly is our mandate in the wake of this part of COVID and what comes next. That clearly is in our interest. That clearly has a bipartisan consensus on it. We do not get arguments about the value of primary care that are, uh, that are, that are articulated by one political camp or the other. There is bipartisan consensus on the value. The issue is, the issue is there isn't the right funding mechanism and support. And let me be very clear, this isn't a, discussion like every other part of the healthcare system where everybody just says more, 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 more. This is a discussion about what kind of healthcare system we wish to build, whether as the concordance recommendations state, we wanna invest in what works, which is primary care. We want to pay for what we want, which is better health that is in large part produced by primary care in communities and with communities. And whether we want to use the value and the unique place that primary care has to ensure that we can reduce economic and social barriers to health. So you have this, you have this locus of value and it's under-resourced, it's underutilized, and it is hurting, as Rebecca said. So then the question is, well, where do we start? And what the report said, again, I'll take 400 pages, I'll put it into five sentences. And they're in order of importance and in order of direction and in order of prioritization. First, we wanna pay for primary care teams to care for people, not for doctors to deliver services. Next, we wanna ensure that high quality primary care is available to every person and family in every community. That's gonna need the, uh, a, a workforce in which we train primary care teams where people live and work. And we also have to redesign health information technology to better serve patient families and providers. And finally, we need to have an accountability mechanism to ensure that this set of reforms are implemented in the US. Now, why did we start with payment? And this is really important because it wasn't an accident and it wasn't just a random sort of draw of the cards. We started with payment because one of our central learnings in reviewing the evidence over the last 25 years in the United States and abroad, but particularly in the United States, is that our efforts to improve primary care, principally through team-based models like the patient-centered medical home, had, for understandable reasons, focused on the delivery side of the equations. Let's start with the provider base. Let's reformat, let's transform teams, let's transform the delivery of care, and then a hope and assume and expect that payment will follow. And what, what happened and what the evidence shows is that primary care can change. Primary care can deliver improved team-based, relationship-focused, information technology-enabled care to populations. That can happen. But it cannot happen easily, predictably, or sustainably within a fee-for-service system. If you take one finding from our report, it is that the evidence is overwhelming. A-plus evidence that the fee-for-service method for paying for healthcare does not work for the kind of proactive, prospective, population-based, preventative care that primary care provides. 
This is not making a whole discussion about prime, uh, payment reform for everything else. We are talking about the evidence for primary care and the evidence is overwhelming. And I would add, because we do study and work with many countries across the world on this, fee-for-service doesn't work for primary care in the US. It doesn't work for primary care abroad. It is simply not attuned and regulated and financed to promote the kind of care that we wish to have. So the first part of the payment re um, reform efforts really talk about the fact that we need to move away from fee-for-service. There's overwhelming evidence that it doesn't work and that we need to move toward hybrid-based reimbursement models, which do not overnight completely upend all the systems that have been attuned to paying for primary care, but really start to move us meaningfully toward a combination of some fee-for-service and a lot more prospective population-based payments to pay for the kind of longitudinal relationships over time that can really build on the best that primary care has to offer. The second part of the recommendations were really about the fact that we need to evaluate and disseminate payment models, not based on their ability to, in 18 months, produce a return on investment to one stakeholder in healthcare in a short time period in the form of reduced costs, but rather on their ability to promote the delivery of equitable, high quality, high performing primary care. Over the long term, six, seven, 10 years, the evidence is clear that primary care based systems paid for in a different, better and higher way do produce overall system changes in terms of improved health equity and, and stabilized or reduced costs, but they don't happen overnight. And so making the case for primary care is not about making the case for it to happen overnight as a cost-saving mechanism. If you want cost-saving mechanisms overnight, I have a list and many others do have a list that do not involve primary care and they involve the 30 to 35 percent of wasteful spending that happens in the U.S. So if you, if you as policymakers or payers want to attack the cost conundrum, we could go there, but not on the backs and not balancing on the backs of primary care, which right now is underfunded at 5% of the system. It needs to be increased funding as a share of total healthcare expenditure, but it's not gonna turn around costs overnight. And that's not the reason to do it. The reason to do it is because of improved outcomes, equity and cost stabilization over time. The third part of our recommendations are really to while we're in this transition toward a change reimbursement model that's hybrid and moving more towards prospective population based payment that CMS and other payers can increase the overall proportion of healthcare spending toward primary care and they can even do it within fee for service. They can change Medicare fee schedules, they can restore the relative um, uh, value scale update committee, the RUC, to more advisory in nature as opposed to accept over 95% of its recommendations. And they can incorporate a wider variety of stakeholders to look at the rationale for improving reimbursement, even within fee for service as an interim to primary care. And finally, we want to really accentuate, and the report talks a lot about the importance of multi-payer collaboration to really continue this movement. Now, in my final minute or two, what does that leave, where does that leave us with? Well, it leaves us with the idea that we now know that we have a wider mandate and a, a necessary and must pass through important in primary care investments and looking at primary care as a common social good, as a common public good to be invested in, not as a, as a short-term um, area to, to make a policy change and hope for a quick ROI. It's the other way around. Primary care is a common good. It has high societal value, and yet it's in a precarious state. It needs new public and payer policy for oversight and monitoring. It needs strong advocacy, organized leadership, and public awareness, as you're seeing with this campaign. And with these changes in payment, which are the, the linchpin, you start with payment change, but you don't end there. The payment change unlocks the delivery change. It's not the other way around. You cannot ask primary care, which has shouldered so much of the burden in the pandemic, to all of a sudden shoulder more burden with the same payment. That's, that's wishful thinking. That's the kind of thinking that's gotten us into conundrum of high burnout and not enough primary care to serve the communities that, that we need to be served. 
and that involves uh, an almost conceptualization of primary care as a charity case. But primary care is not a charity case. It's the linchpin. It's the foundation of a high-performing healthcare system that you as a stakeholder, as a policymaker, as a payer, as a provider system, want to invest in. If you're moving toward accountable care, then you want to make sure that your investments into accountable care are attuned and actually investing in the base of your healthcare system, which is primary care, to make sure that it is there to achieve the goals of accountable care. Or if you're not in accountable care yet, that's where this the, the trajectories are going and you're going to need primary care to get you to your common goals. We have to start with payment, but we don't end payment. Payment opens the fiscal space, unlocks the door for the primary care delivery and patient partnership transformation to happen. And then what happens, and I'll say in my, the last minute, is that this is something that takes all of us. It's not something that if you're in one segment of the healthcare system or if you're a payer, you can just wait for other payers to do. Let them shoulder the burden first. Hope you know they can take the first hits and then you'll come along. This, if we are to assume and to achieve our common aims, it requires everybody to make a small but notable contribution to a renewed, reinvigorated, refunded kind of primary care. The days of freeloading and waiting to see what happens are going to basically starve the system of the primary care that it needs because primary care in some ways is the oxygen of a high performing equitable healthcare system. So we have to invest in this as a common good. This isn't a charity case, it's a necessary case. And th there are partners ready in the provider segment of primary care and in the patient partnership segment of primary care that are ready, willing and able to take these renewed investments and translate them into improved outcomes with equity. Thank you, Asaf. Uh, the linchpin of a high-performing health system, the oxygen of a high-performing equi equitable health system is primary care. Uh, thank you very much for those comments uh, and for laying out that roadmap. I think that's the, that's the point of Better Health Now, the title of our campaign. It means focusing on patients and the health of individuals, families, and communities. We believe that the pathway is a stronger redesigned primary care system. And so continuing next up with our range of perspectives, we wanna hear from two experts who work in this system every day. Uh, a professional who works with patients directly and of course, a practicing family physician. First is Arturo Martinez Guijosa, who has professional and personal experience helping patients and family members navigate the health system. He lives in Seattle, as does our physician guest, Dr. Emily Godfrey, who works at clinics associated with the University of Washington. They will talk about their personal experiences among patients and as a physician and the challenges and the joys of primary care. Thank you for the introduction, Mark, and thank you to the PCC for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm, our nonprofit serves about 14,000 families each year. Our community health case managers and patient navigators partner with the adults, the kids to work to ensure that those in our region who face the most challenging health issues um, are connected to services to get healthy and stay healthy. Uh, and helping families meet with a primary care provider is just one of those key things we do. Um, but it is getting tougher. It was already a hurdle to find culturally relevant primary care providers, and the last few years haven't made that even more difficult. Um, our community clinicians are over overwhelmed and are burned out, and that isn't being and that is being felt in the quality of the care to our community. Um, the tragedy occurs when you learn uh, the real stories of people left behind. Um, I'll share. Um, let me share the details about a terrific high school student. He hadn't been feeling well, but there was no obviously obvious clues about his condition. And um, eventually our team decided he was probably dealing with prediabetes. We were able to establish the appropriate care for him near his home. Uh, unfortunately, the clinic we had referred him to did not have the systems nor capacity to support his family. In addition to the time between appointments was too long and there were cultural issues as well. Um, eventually his care, his, his case was transferred to the children's hospital. Um, three months later, he had to be rushed to the emergency room. The medical situation had gotten much worse, and then the ER had diagnosed him with type 1 diabetes. Um, you know, today, his diabetes is under control, but the enormous burden this uh, young man and our health system could have been avoided. Um, many and many of our patients have trouble scheduling an appointment or getting to an appointment with a primary care provider. It can take weeks or sometimes months. 
and the visits are too short and all of their needs are sometimes addressed. I mean, better care now. These are the words and ideas my colleagues and the families we serve embrace uh, and we stand with this campaign. Um, thanks, Arturo. Um, so I guess I'm like Arturo, I'm really excited to be here to support the Better Care Now campaign and to share my stories alongside Arturo as a practicing family physician in Seattle, Washington. I have a unique perspective because I have a dual appointment, both in family medicine and in gynecology. So I spend part of my week as a specialist working in a hospital-based clinic and part of my week as a primary care provider in a family medicine clinic alongside nurse practitioners, physician assistants who are also primary care providers. I can tell all of you today that I know um, firsthand, um, both as a specialty provider and as a primary care provider, that there is a world of difference um, between the two different settings. And I just wanna cover two of the most glaring differences. The first is that in the specialty care setting, there are more highly skilled people to help. So um, specialists are reimbursed at a higher rate and it allows them to hire staff that in addition to those that we have in primary care, they have um, highly skilled registered nurses, like an army of nurses that are um, managing patient messages and requests that come in um, from patients throughout the day. And this allows me, when I'm in clinic, it allows me to focus on the patients that I'm seeing in clinic on that day. And as a result, I have fewer patient administrative issues to address after my workday is complete. In contrast, in primary care, our clinic is lucky, and I'm telling you, lucky to have one nurse for 45 clinicians. Um, we certainly have medical assistants as we do in the specialty clinic, but their scope of care is much more limited than a skilled registered nurse. And as a consequence, um, when I get home after seeing patients all day, I have upwards of four hours of administrative work after um, seeing patients, um, answering messages that came in throughout the day, um, informing patients about lab results, medication refills, and none of this is billable um, to an insurance company. The second glaring difference between specialty care and primary care is the time in which I get to see my patients. So as a specialist, I have 40 minutes to see most patients who come in and are coming in to see me for a single complex issue. In primary care, I only have 15 minutes to see most patients. And even if a patient has seen any primary care provider in our system and they're new to me, um, they're still considered a return visit and only get a 15 minute appointment. And in addition, um, what has already been expressed during our panel today, um, there's not enough primary care providers. And because it's so hard to get an appointment, Patients bundle their issues and have at least four to five issues that they want to address in a 15 minute appointment. And as a result, I have to tell my patients that um, we can only address one to two issues, which really um, support what Arturo was saying, that issues are not being addressed. And patients inevitably have to come back, many of which don't um, come back because it's simply not um, convenient. And it just makes the notion of having a, a deep relationship with my patients very difficult. Um, and the short 15 minute time slot makes it really hard for me to practice in my scope of care as a primary care provider. And it puts me in a position to simply um, fill out referrals where I send patients to specialists. And this kind of care really makes for fragmented care. And I would say that probably 30% of my patients where I'm sending them to specialists for things I probably could have addressed in the primary care clinic, but just don't have the time or support to do so. Um, those patients often don't follow up with the specialist um, and don't get the care that they need. Um, I just want to end that on a separate note, as um, Becca pointed out, the pandemic has 
really taught us that telemedicine and phone calls and asynchronous email exchanges have enhanced the ability for patients to be in touch with their primary care providers. And while these modalities are good for patients, they're not good for primary care clinics simply because of the way the payment system is set up, that unless a patient is face-to-face -face with me in the clinic, um, most of the work that we do and the interactions that we have with patients is not in any way billable. And so all of these other modalities that work for our patients, that work for communities, um, are often not sustainable in the primary care setting. Um, so like Arturo, I, I stand with the campaign and um, I'm, I'm gonna hand it, I guess, back over to Anne. Thank you very much. Well, Emily, thank you very much. And Arturo, thank you very much for bringing these crucial perspectives to this discussion. Uh, I think it is, it is important for us to, to hear from the field what's actually happening out there in practice while we're thinking about the system. So uh, I appreciate your contributions, both of you, so much to this event today. And thank you for your support of the campaign. Uh, that's great. So let's go back now to Anne, uh, the CEO of PCC, to talk more about the campaign participants and supporter, uh, supporters of the Better Health Now campaign and what we're calling for. Uh, we, there's been an active chat and we'll have some more time for Q&A after Anne's remarks. So Anne, uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Mark. And please do put your questions um, into the chat. So I am so pleased now to recognize the leadership of the organizations who by signing on to our campaign have indicated that they are ready and willing to work together to achieve a more equitable, higher quality and sustainable health system. So many of them are already innovating around the country, and we seek to channel those ideas into our future policy proposals. I'm not going to call out the names of the 34 campaign participants representing a majority of PCC members and the additional organizations who have signed on as supporters because our time is short. But as you can see by looking at the logos here on the slides, they represent all the members of a diverse primary care team, leading consumer organizations, employers, research and quality groups, and innovators of all stripes. And I am very excited by the new kinds of organizations who have recently joined us to advance the, co the cause. Organizations that represent rural primary care, Organizations that um, represent community health centers that serve the safety net. Members of the team, community health workers that can help link primary care, uh, help primary care to link patients to community-based services. And some of America's leading primary care innovators who have already transitioned to a prospective payment and have built out robust teams that are already meeting patients' needs in a comprehensive way. Each and every one of the, of the signatory organizations is committed to helping to restore America's physical, mental, and social health and should be applauded for their leadership. Together, united by a vision of better health, now we call on President Biden and all members of Congress to join us in shaping Medicare and Medicaid policy, which covers over 35% of the population and plays an outsized role in communities where primary care access and availability are lacking, in, including rural communities, urban communities, black and brown communities. We are also committed to continuing our work with employers and health plans to align policies across the public and private sectors. In short, and to sum up, we are rallying around three principles. Invest in what works, primary care. Pay for what we want, better health. And reduce economic and social barriers to that better health. Thank you to all who have signed on to our campaign and to those we expect to join us. We are extremely excited by this outpouring of support and our work ahead. And now let me take some questions. And I will um, also um, invite all of my panelists to join me as well. Uh, one of the first questions we received was who should be 
on the primary care team. And I'll take a first shot at that and then invite uh, my fellow panelists to jump in. Um, you know, we really believe that needs to be determined by the needs of the community, um, that who's on the team needs to be reflective of what the patients in that community need. But what we do know is that we can no longer silo physical health from mental health, from meeting needs that um, are, are uh, to address social vulnerabilities, because we know the outcomes of care really uh, are affected by the community context. Uh, would anyone else like to jump in on that question? From your uh, perspective as an online provider or, or, or otherwise? You know, Anne, I, I agree with everything you say. I, primary care is a set of interlinking functions. It's not about a service line or, you know, a predefined set of credentials. It's, you know, about building a team to provide first contact, accessible access, uh, continuity, coordination, comprehensiveness, and, and, a, and a longitudinal relationship over time built on trust. Whomever you have and need and you define with your patient partners and your community as, as being key to that provision of those functions is, is who should be on the team. Thank you, um, agreed there. I think what we also know from work that um, was, has been done at the um, Harvard Center for Primary Care, that unless we are paying prospectively and a large proportion of a practice's revenue is prospective, that practices are um, not able to build out that team to provide a comprehensive set of services. So here's where the, our vision for the delivery system um, interacts uh, with our payment policy. And, and as you said so um, uh, well, uh, Asaf, we really need to uh, move that investment into primary care so we can open up the space for that delivery system reform. And we do see this in practices around the country. Um, another question that's come up is, where will those dollars um, come from? And I think um, this is something that we're gonna be uh, exploring um, as we set our policy agenda. But we do wanna to point to that there are examples um, uh, in public programs, uh, in the private sector, where they have shifted towards primary care, more investment in, in primary care, um, Medicare, Medi Medicare Advantage plans, um, Medicare ACOs, private sector ACOs, et cetera, that are achieving um, these improvements in population health and, and actually also in some cases reducing costs. So we know it is possible. We just need to figure out the mechanics of doing that. Um, the NASM report gives some great ideas. We need to move those recommendations from policy to paper or excuse me, from paper to policy. That's what we need to do. Um, uh, any other of the panels want to jump in on that, um, that, that question about investment? Well, um, I would just say it's it's clearly possible. I mean, the state of Rhode Island doubled investment and in, uh, mandated that that you know commercial payers double investment in, in primary care over uh, a five year period, and uh, and actually even redistributed it from by putting price caps on hospital cost growth. And uh, there was a lot of nervousness and a lot of concern uh, in the hospital and specialty communities at the start of this. By the end. That concern was abated because it turned out that 1% per year growth in primary care payment in absolute terms uh, made a big difference for primary care and quite frankly wasn't greatly felt or missed in the other parts of the health system. So that's how you go from 5 to 10% over five years with, um, with notable improvements and I think that's a model we should look Thank you, um, and Asaf for raising those examples. Um, there are now um, 10 states that are pursuing um, investing more in primary care, following that Rhode Island 
model. Um, uh, another uh, dozen states have already have legislation in place to report primary care spend. Uh, five of them are increasing that payment. So we really do feel like there's a momentum in the states to reorient their systems toward primary care. I think we're all here today um, celebrating that momentum in the states and those state leaders, but recognizing that we need a uh, effort at the federal level that is across uh, the entire country that moves all communities forward. Um, and we have some wonderful examples of that. And now we need spread. Uh, we've got innovators and now let's figure out what the policy is that will unleash those innovators uh, uh, and others to be able to move towards, um, you know, the sort of team-based comprehensive primary care we're looking for. I do have a question here um, about, um, you know, uh, our efforts and are we trying to, um, you know, uh, better um, uh, move primary care and specialists to more equity in terms of payment? Who would like to take that question? I'm happy to uh, as well. This is Mark. I can jump in briefly on that. And thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I, I think it was Asaf who said it as, as we we're talking about um, uh, financing methodologies for primary care. The moment that we start getting into the idea of who's a winner and who's a loser. Uh, uh, if this is a zero sum game in which in which some people are going to gain and some people are going to lose, I, I think we will distract ourselves from the policy environment that we're trying to build. If we if we stay focused on the innovation and the excitement of what can happen with increased investment in primary care, uh, whether it's overcoming health inequities, building better outcomes, uh, creating that, that system that is uh, family-centered that we all uh, want to focus on. I think the excitement of, of investments in primary care with those outcomes, as, a as opposed to sort of figuring out like which is the pie big enough and how to divide it differently, uh, I think there are systems in place that, that put primary care at the back of the line. We've got to address those. There's no doubt about that. We need an advocacy strategy. This campaign is about that. We need to be very honest and open about the fact that we need more investment in primary care. We need to do that differently. We need to pay it differently. It has to be a bigger part of the healthcare system. Uh, but we don't have to do that by, uh, by delineating in, in great detail about uh, who, whose pockets we're picking here. I, I think we have to decide uh, who, what, what is the system that we want to build, what are the outcomes that we're trying to look for, uh, and how do we drive towards that? Thank you. Um, Mark, um, I think we're really um, out of time. I guess I would um, close and then turn it back to you by saying, um, you are gonna be hearing from us. Um, we are just launching this campaign. Um, the specific policy objectives will be coming in the coming months. Uh, we are very excited to bring together so many leading organizations who support um, the concordance recommendations, which really uh, are, are really take the DNA from the NASM payment recommendations and move those forward. Uh, we're Extremely excited to have so many of you um, joining us here on the webinar today and um, look forward to the work ahead. Now over to you, Mark. Oh, I'm so sorry that this is over. I, I, I wish that we had more time. Uh, we're just, the chat's rolling in, the conversation is happening. We have assembled an incredible panel um, here. Uh, Becca, Asaf, Arturo, Emily, thank you so much for contributing to this launch. This is an important day. I hope that we'll remember this day as the beginning of something powerful that created real change in, uh, in, in primary care. Uh, th this is an important moment. So thank you for joining us and being a part of it. Thank you to the sort of hundreds of people who are here uh, at this moment with us. And uh, I invite you to be a part of this campaign. Uh, join us and, and help us get our, our goals across the finish line here. It's gonna take a lot of work by a lot of parts of the healthcare system, uh, all oars in the water rowing as fast as we can. We're excited about what we're doing. We think the momentum is with us. We gotta build on that now and uh, create policies that can implement it. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you for all that you're doing now and all that you're about to do for primary care as we launch this campaign. 
have a good rest of your day, everybody.